right, looks like we've uh, reached the top of the hour, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, first off, I want to welcome you to this broadcast of Lagoon 101, Lagoons 101, uh, Wastewater Lagoon Basics. My name is Ben Shackman, and I'm with Triple Point Environmental. I'll start by introducing Triple Point, who we are and why we're doing Lagoon webinars, and how we're happy that you decided to spend this time with us, especially if you haven't joined us for one of these before. And then I'll get into it. The focus of our webinar today is going to be wastewater treatment lagoons. At the end, I'll leave some time for questions. And uh, please feel free to submit your questions at any point during the presentation. I'll, uh, I'll get to them at the end. You can submit the questions through the portal. Uh, Triple Point has been doing lagoon webinars for a couple of years. We've stepped, up to, we've stepped up the frequency now that so many people are having conferences and trainings canceled. Uh, so an hour after the webinar ends, you'll be getting an email with a survey and a link to download a PDF certificate of attendance. If you need a more detailed certificate, just shoot us an email and we'll get one for you. Uh, so the outline is on the screen. We're going to talk our way through all of these different topics today. I hope you're uh, settled in, uh, ready for a, a nice little webinar here. Hopefully you have a beverage of your choice and um, hopefully we'll have some good questions when we get to the end also. So as I, uh, as I said, I'm gonna start with a triple point introduction, starting with myself. Uh, my name's Ben Shackman and I'm the Midwest Regional Sales Manager at Triple Point. Um, been in the water and utility industry for about seven and a half years now. I spent 26 plus in the Army before that. Uh, my wife and I live in the suburbs of St. Louis. We've been married for over 25 years and uh, have two kids in college. So Triple Point Environmental, uh, we, we are very, very proud of the fact that uh, we ranked number 1381 on Inc. Magazine's list of the 5,000 fastest growing companies in the United States last year. We anticipate being ranked again this year. Uh, we don't know where we'll wind up in the numbers, but we anticipate being ranked. Uh, also, this year, uh, we were part of the inaugural class of Inc.'s top 250 in the Midwest. So very proud to be uh, recognized as one of the top 250 uh, companies in the Midwest by Inc. Magazine. Uh, next up, our uh, core values. Um, we, uh, we actually have these painted on the wall of our office. Uh, we, we use these to inform our decisions and uh, refer to them frequently. I know a lot of companies have core values that are you know, kind of printed out on a card, put away somewhere, never looked at or touched, but we, we really do believe in our core values and, and we try to practice them on a daily basis. Our installations. Uh, what you see now is a list of the triple point installations going back to 2003 and stretching forward to projects that are currently in progress uh, being built. Um, these are installations all over the United States and even in Canada. So the triple point difference is something that I want to address also. Uh, first and foremost, triple point is a lagoon services com company. Uh, lagoons are all we do, and that's wrapped up in our first motto here, that lagoons do it better. At Triple Point, we believe that lagoons are a technology that's going to remain important in modern days and with modern permit limits. Lagoons are a very cost-effective way for small towns and industrial plants uh, to treat their wastewater. Lagoons can be upgraded to meet any wastewater treatment standard that comes along. Uh, our second unique is that we have a, ta a tailored process. We treat every lagoon system that we talk to as a blank slate. We want to work with you, whether you're the owner or the engineer, to find a solution for uh, your problems and one that fits your budget. Uh, it's, a tail it's a tailored process. We work with you rather than just trying to give you something off the shelf. And then lastly, we say it, we do it. Uh, we're in the business of making all of our customers happy customers. That's why we give the we say it, we, we do it guarantee. Uh, we not only warranty our products, but we guarantee the process outcome for two to five years. And just to show how much confidence we have in our process and our belief that you will be a happy customer once we go through the design process, we'll be talking about that. Uh, we say it, we do it guarantee a little bit more later as well. So looking at our product line, uh, what, what stands out first of all is that 
uh, disinfection and head works and screens and clarifiers, none of those things are on there. Uh, we are a lagoon company and left to right, uh, Aries is our lagoon aeration solution. Uh, nitrox right next to it is for ammonia removal. And if you have a nitrogen limit on your permit, we can bolt another module onto the nitrox to accomplish your nitrogen removal goals as well. And then last over on the right is the Fosbox, and that's our phosphorus removal uh, solution. So if you've got an issue with lagoon wastewater treatment, probably we've got a product that can help make things better. Uh, digging a little deeper into the Aries, I, Aris, uh, Aries, excuse me, Aries, I want to talk a little bit more about the Aries. Uh, so our design philosophy is what's shown on this slide. Uh, first thing I'd like to point out, if you look at the left, is an empty pond uh, with aerators arranged on the bottom of the cell and individual airlines running to them from those manifold stations that you see along the shore. Uh, looking over to the right, uh, large mixing area, we're depicting a 125 foot diameter area of influence at the surface. That's how big of an area the bubbles will disturb. Uh, and then onshore blowers. And this is really important because at Triple Point, we very strongly believe that if you make it easier to do maintenance, maintenance will get done. And maintenance is important because it affects how your system operates and what it costs you to operate that system. In addition to the life cycle, you will get longer life out of properly maintained equipment. So by moving the maintenance on shore and by moving the ability to tune those aerators on shore, uh, what we've created is a situation where you don't need two or three or four people, including safeties and monitors and operators and boat drivers and all that to do simple maintenance. One person can pull up park, change the, change the oil in the blower, change the air filter, adjust the airflow in the lagoon, monitor everything from shore. Uh, it's, a, it's a hallmark of how we design systems. So the uh, Aries aerator is going to start shipping this summer. Uh, we're pretty proud of this. It's, a, it's a, an advancement or a refinement of our existing product, the Mars aerator, that are uh, thousands and thousands of those aerators around the U.S. and up into Canada, too. Um, but I want to call out a couple of things that are different about the Aries. Uh, so first off, uh, quick connect fittings. Uh, the legacy product involves threaded connections. And when you mix plastic and metal and threads, it's inevitable that someone's going to create a, a problem. And cross-threading a uh, diffuser tube when you're screwing it into that uh, connector hub that molded hub, uh, you know, that, that just creates all sorts of problems. It creates delays, it increases installation expense. If it happens during periodic maintenance, it leads to downtime. So with quick connects, it's a quarter turn, it's a positive detent and it's a snap that you can feel and, and you know, hear a little bit too. Uh, so we've, we've increased the speed with which uh, this equipment can be deployed into a system. Um, along those same lines, we've retained the uh, static tube. Uh, we're putting coarse bubble aeration in that static tube. It's held up off of the bottom of the lagoon, so the Venturi effect creates some nice mixing. We're actually pulling water and uh, loose, loose pieces of sludge into the uh, aerator and then tossing it up into the water column where it can come in contact with uh, the bugs, the microbes. And if you put oxygen, nutrients, and, and uh, microbial organisms in the same space, digestion occurs and wastewater treatment is, is taking place. Um, so another thing I wanna point out on the Aries is that we've reduced the total weight. Uh, we went from a CNC manufacturing process where we started with a big block of raw material and that then got machined down to that molded hub or to the hub. It was machined hub in the, in the uh, Mars. With the Aries, that's molded, and we've been able to drive a lot of the buoyancy out of the design. Less buoyancy means we need less ballast. Less ballast lowers shipping weight, makes it easier to maneuver these uh, units on site and get them into the ponds and back out again for maintenance. Uh, so jumping over here, we're going to see um, 
some computational fluid dynamics uh, depicted on the screen. You can see on the right, we've got an Aries aerator, and you can see it drawing and you know tossing up into the water column. On the left, a couple of uh, nice CFD images, um, one showing the, uh, the nice circular pattern that we get with the uh, radial design, uh, the other one showing a uh, top view with uh, diffuse bubbles, uh, the fine bubble diffusers in action. Another CFD here, and this is just uh, to show that we're disturbing the water's surface significantly, much more than you would if you just had fine bubble diffusion. And that process of disturbing the water's surface is going to be important. We're going to talk about the, the benefits of disturbing the water's surface in a few minutes. If we take a look at how that aerator draws from the bottom of the pond, we're going to see those directional arrows indicating that the uh, coarse bubble diffuser using uh, the Venturi effect is, you know, moving, moving further and further, water and sludge from further and further away from the aerator, uh, which all promotes better digestion, better treatment, and, you know, more complete treatment of the, of the waste stream. So leaving aeration for a minute and jumping over to uh, ammonia control, ammonia removal, uh, that's done with our Nitrox product. And the Nitrox product is typically applied, you can see like the picture here, um, we've got a three cell lagoon, uh, two aerated cells, and then over on the right, that appears to be non-aerated, a quiescent cell or quiet cell. And uh, we've got the Nitrox between cell two and three. So the majority of the treatment has already been done before the water reaches the Nitrox, the water enter, enters the nitrox, 100% of the water, 100% of the flow goes into the nitrox out of cell two. And while it's in the nitrox, it's exposed to a controlled biomass. Uh, so that is what a cell of a nitrox looks like. And also uh, an image of a media carrier. Um, so inside of this cell down at the bottom, we've got a, we've got a diffuser, a bubble diffuser, and that's creating medium bubbles, which is creating all kinds of mixing. There's lots and lots of kinetic energy here, lots and lots of mixing taking place. Uh, so you may remember I said that if you put the bug, the air, and the nutrient into the same space, then nature will take its course. That's exactly what we're doing here. Now, the, uh, the autotrophic bacteria that do nitrification, um, they're a little bit different than the heterotrophs that live in the, live in the lagoon and do the heavy lifting of BOD removal. There will be some heterotrophs in the, in the nitrox also, but we're very deliberately creating the situation, the environment that's going to be conducive to uh, autotrophs as opposed to heterotrophs, because those are the bugs that we need. Uh, so autotrophs don't really float around in the water column and live very well. Uh, they like to grow on something. They like to attach to something. So surface area becomes an important conversation. Uh, the image on the left is our standard media, uh, 750 M2, M3. What that, what that refers to is that media has 750 square meters of surface area for every cubic meter of media. So think of a box that's you know, roughly three feet square, and it's full of the media, and you get 750 square feet of surface area out of that box. Uh, a newer product that we're uh, that we're bringing in also is the biochip, and that's up to 4,500 M2, M3. Uh, that'll be important a little bit later when we start to talk about volume and reaction times and things like that. But uh, for now, let's just you know maybe conceptualize this a little bit different. So we're going to grow a biomass, and we've got to have a lot of surface area. And if we look at the Typical surface area of an aerated lagoon, uh, it's about 167,000 square feet. So that M2, M3, or I'm sorry, that 750 media is going to fill up roughly a third of that trailer to equal 167,000 square feet of surface area. So in the reactor itself, that media has the micro, uh, microbial organisms growing on it. They're bouncing around constantly. They're, they're chewing their way through the ammonia in a process called nitrification. Um, here's a view of kind of a whole system. Uh, I do want to point out a couple of things. So temperature regulation, 
that's uh, part of that's part of how we get those autotrophic bacteria interested and active uh, as the weather gets colder, as the water in the ponds gets colder, uh, bacteria slow down. They slow down at a rate of about 50% for every 10 degrees Celsius reduction in temperature. Uh, so to keep them happy and moving and doing what we want them to do, uh, we, have, um, we have added heat to uh, the, the nitrox, to the nitrification process. On the left, you see an example of a plate and frame heat exchanger, and on the right, you see an immersion heater. Kind of, kind of think of the immersion heater as an oversized fish tank heater. Uh, now, we're not looking for a swimming pool weather, swimming pool kind of water temperatures. It's not a hot tub. Um, all we need is just a few degrees of rise. So by maintaining about a 4C uh, temperature in the nitrox, we we just get great removal and we're uh, producing water that is way below the uh, the permitted limits, affluent limits. So very proud of the product, very proud of the technology. Uh, it's based on something called an MBBR, a moving bed bioreactor. Uh, it's about a 50 year old technology and what you're seeing are the improvements that we've made to it. And along with those improvements, uh, we say it, we do it. Uh, so we have uh, these process guarantees in place. None of them have been used yet, but we issue a guarantee every time we do one of these systems. And uh, it's important to note that our philosophy on our customers, with our customers, is that we're never just simply walking away. We're going to stay involved. We're going to keep in touch. We're going to provide help and assistance and guidance and information and you know, serve as a reference into the future for our customers. Uh, you'll hear more about that a little bit later. Uh, but now it's time to jump into some basic terminology. And I would invite you to uh, use a cell phone if you have it, if you want to grab a picture of any of these slides. Um, on the terminology slides, I'm going to go through them uh, by putting one up, pausing for a short period, letting folks read it, and then I'll pick out a couple of key items that I want to talk and then go on to the next one. Uh, so here's the first of three terminology slides, and I'll give everyone an opportunity to take a look at that. So a couple items I want to call out on this slide. Uh, the first one is BOD, or biological oxygen demand. Uh, very simply, it's, it's how much oxygen is required remember that triad, bug, food, air, how much oxygen is required to get digestion to occur? Uh, and digestion will be the organic material, so you can't digest inorganics. Um, so biological oxygen demand, how much air do we need to add to the water in order to uh, get the microbial population excited and hungry and eating and reproducing and growing and all happy? That's one. Uh, the other one I wanted to talk on this slide is coalescence. Uh, so if you think about that, if you think about a bubble being released at the bottom of a lagoon, uh, and it'll rise all the way through the water column to the surface and burst. Uh, if there's a bubble released right next to it, the longer that they travel, the further that they travel, the more likely it is that they will coalesce or come together and form one larger bubble. Uh, so this leads to uh, some changes in design because we have to account for a diminishing oxygen transfer efficiency as the bubbles rise and coalesce. Uh, the last thing I want to talk on this slide is the difference between controlled discharge and continuous discharge. Uh, both of these pertain to how you release the treated water from the lagoon. In a controlled discharge system, the permit includes uh, information about how much water can be discharged and when it can be discharged. Uh, so that may that may be expressed in terms of uh, discharge during the month of April and October. Uh, that could be expressed in terms of discharge at a rate of X gallons per minute for X number of hours per day uh, during this time frame. Controlled discharge. So. With controlled discharge, uh, thinking about mass balance, you've got to have storage capacity sufficient 
for all of your inflow, all of the water that's arrived in the lagoon since your last discharge. You have to be able to store it until your next one. So that does affect design and sizing. Uh, continuous discharge is more like flow through. Uh, so think about a molecule of water entering at the inlet and it winds its way through the entire treatment process and then it exited, exits at the outlet, the effluent. And as it exits, the next mole another molecule of water is coming in. Uh, so flow through, you don't need to have as much excess capacity with a continuous discharge lagoon. Here's our next slide and I'll pause for a minute and let everyone take a look. Okay, I wanna call out um, just, just one from the center of this slide and that's inflow and infiltration, I and I. So the lagoon industry, the wastewater industry is pretty robust. We've been around for a long time and we have pretty good rules of thumbs built. So if we know that it's an average town in the southeastern United States with a population of 1,600 people, we can very quickly do some rough calculations to determine sizing. Uh, but that'll only be sizing based on those 1,600 households. That won't be sizing based on everything else going on that affects the system. Uh, so let's let's pick on uh, let's pick on our friends at Walmart for a minute. Uh, when Walmart builds a store, they have to do a stormwater uh, survey as part of their uh, part of their design and part of uh, getting permitted to build the build the new facility. And they've got to look at the impact of the parking lot because that big parking lot is going to just catch so much water during rain events. And the question becomes, where does it go? Uh, so that's a real big thing that can that can lead to I and I if stormwater is getting into your wastewater. Uh, stormwater also gets into wastewater just simply through rain falling. Uh, rain lands in the lagoon. Um, rain lands in catchment basins. It gets swept into uh, it gets swept into um, the sewage system. It leaks in where roots have penetrated sewer pipe. There are just so many, so many different examples of I and I. But when you add it all up, it's entirely possible that adding your I and I can double your treatment requirement, your sizing. Uh, so I and I is a really significant um, factor on the on the wastewater industry. Uh, next slide, and I'll give everyone a second to kind of look through this as well. So on this slide, I'd like to discuss sludge a little bit more. Uh, very simply, it's accumulated biosolids found at the bottom of the lagoon. It's a combination of organics and inorganics. It's a natural byproduct of microbial digestion. Um, you know, quite frankly, lagoons are referred to as sludge storage facilities for a reason. Uh, that's why they're there. Um, one of the major pieces of expense in running a lagoon system is periodically, uh, 15, 20, 30 years, um, dredging out the lagoon system and dewatering that sludge and uh, disposing of it either through uh, land application or ground spread, or uh, most typically it gets, uh, it gets landfill. Um, but that sludge is the uh, waste product of the lagoon, if you will, uh, so that we can put out clean water in the effluent. Um, when you think about sludge and you think about it being at the bottom of the lagoon, that's the sludge blanket. And that, that accumulates and that grows. And as it grows, it displaces progressively more and more of the volume of the lagoon system. So that leads to a reduction in hydraulic retention time. That leads to uh, reduction in theoretical treatment capacity. All of these are things that uh, we take into account when we're looking at the design of a lagoon system. The other thing that we look at very, very closely when we're looking at a design of a lagoon system are the references that I'm going to discuss next. Uh, the first one comes from the EPA. Uh, this is available free on the internet for download and uh, certainly a, a good one to have in your library if you're doing anything with lagoons anywhere in the United States. Uh, around the world, there may be some value, but I know we've got some, some international attendees today, and I would urge you to please look at local regulations. Uh, so the EPA's guidance, principles of design and operations. 
Uh, next one up is um, a, uh, a group of 10 states in the Upper Mississippi River Valley area. Uh, form the Great Lakes Upper Mississippi River Board uh, and publishes a 10 state standard. Uh, you can find it for free on the internet. 2018 shown on the right is the current version. I've yet to find 2018 free. Uh, 2014's out there all over the place as a PDF to download, uh, but 2018 appears to be purchase only. Uh, Triple Point doesn't receive any revenue from uh, from the 10, 10 states standards folks, um, but this is a very, very valuable reference, certainly do recommend it. Uh, the next reference is one that um, I keep very close at hand. That's it right there, if you could hear me wiggling it. But this is uh, Steve Harris's book. It's published by h &S Environmental. And uh, we do sponsor one and two day seminars taught by Steve. Uh, this is direct purchase at his website. Uh, he offers a money back guarantee. Zero dollars flows to triple point for um, for mentioning his book or anything like that. But in our opinion, uh, this really does belong on every Lagoon operator's desk. And it is just full of information that you can put to use immediately. Very, very valuable resource. Highly recommend it. Uh, we're ready to talk about the different types of lagoons now. And it's probably important to point out first for the United States uh, that lagoons are everywhere. And my goodness, look at all of those lagoons. Now, if we, uh, if we overlay the 10 state standards image that I showed you before, uh, you can see that, you know, it's, it's not the majority, but it's certainly a significant percentage of the lagoons in the United States uh, fit into the 10 states. So continuing our conversation here, uh, we should look at what the EPA has to say. And the EPA tells us that these systems have been in use for over 3,000 years and over 120 years in the United States. And with over 8,000 wastewater treatment ponds, uh, remarkably half, more than half of the wastewater treatment facilities in the United States are lagoon systems. Out of that percentage, facultative ponds account for about 62%, aerated lagoons at 25, and then you've got some uh, less common systems down there as well, with total containment basically being an evaporative system. So knowing that facultative ponds represent the largest slice, that's probably a good place for us to start. Uh, so these are simple to operate, but it's important to note that you can see more variability than in other types. They're typically in the three to eight foot deep range, sometimes a little bit more. Um, as that sludge layer builds up, remember what we were talking about is that sludge layer builds up though, uh, that depth goes down and the volume goes down. So that all gets accounted for in the design. So a facultative lagoon is gonna depend on wind to transfer oxygen through the liquid air barrier. Uh, think about wind blowing across the surface of the pond. You've got air molecules and water molecules and they're, they're bumping up against each other at that liquid air barrier, air liquid barrier. And um, what's taking place is that the water molecules are trying to reach equilibrium with their environment. And since there's more air in the, there's more oxygen in the air than in the water, they're gonna, they're gonna naturally pull it in. The water molecules are gonna naturally pull the air in to reach uh, homeostasis. Um, so that's one way that air gets into a facultative lagoon because there's no mechanical aeration and no mixing taking place. Uh, so another neat thing about facultative lagoons that doesn't apply in aerated lagoons is that you wind up with an aerobic layer overlaying an anaerobic layer in the water column. So that, that just simply says that you've got different types of microbial organisms at work on digesting the sludge. Uh, aerobic bacteria are um, up top, anaerobic or down below and hanging with the sludge blanket. Uh, we've been talking a little bit about the impact of temperature on reaction times and uh, microbial activity. So it should come as no surprise that uh, the EPA thinks that a warmer climate, you don't need to hold on to the water for a uh, good treatment as long as you do in a colder climate. You've got a couple of ranges there from the EPA. Uh, performance wise, you're gonna get about 75% removal on the BOD5 test. Now I talked BOD in the uh, in the definitions section, but I didn't 
hit BOD5 because I want to talk it here. So when you submit a sample to a lab, they run a five-day test. They sample that culture for, they sample that for five days and they determine um, in milligrams per liter how much biological oxygen demand is still remaining at the end of that five-day period, what's been consumed. Uh, and then TSS, total suspended solids, get about 90, up to about 90% removal. But algae can actually uh, dilute that. Algae in your effluent um, shows up as suspended solids and it, it, it alters that number. Odor can be an issue due to uh, turnover. We talked a little bit about aerobic and anaerobic. The other thing that's going on is you can wind up with war warmer water under colder water in a lagoon, in a facultative lagoon. And uh, as we know, heat, heat rises. Uh, when it rises, when it turns back over, a lot of times you can uh, pull some sludge with it. And if that happens, uh, you're gonna be releasing hydrogen sulfide and methane. And H2S and methane are gonna make your phone ring for odor complaints more, more likely than not. Uh, they do also facultative lagoons do accumulate sludge a little bit faster in colder climates than aerated lagoons. Uh, and then I've got a tip here in, uh, in the event you're running a facultative system and you've got overloading events, maybe you've got a big festival that happens every July or something like that, uh, you can add some air into a facultative lagoon and uh, that'll assist with overloading events. So here's a nifty picture of a facultative lagoon and still water, that, that just, that looks so tranquil to me. So moving on, um, we're gonna talk about mixing and treatment rates in aerated lagoons. And I'm putting this slide up because I wanna make a couple of points. Uh, first of all, kinetic rate is, uh, that, that's derived from mixing. So absent mixing, as in a facultative lagoon, there really isn't a kinetic treatment rate. So facultative would wind up somewhere off to the left if you were to arbitrarily just put a dot on there for where you think it would be. Um, but as, as the kinetic treatment rate increases, the complexity of the system increases, and we're going to talk our way through them. So we'll start with partial mix and work our way across. Uh, partial mix is going to be a smaller footprint than a facultative system for the same flow or loading. With that aeration in there, you can digest uh, those nutrients quicker, so you can build a smaller system. Um, you're only going to provide enough aeration to satisfy the O2 requirements with a partial mix, and you'll see that change in, uh, in later mixes, later types. Um, but the uh, O2 requirements are going to be defined by the influent water's nutrient loading. Depth up to about 20 feet and uh, air is not going to be evenly distributed across the entire system. Uh, we're going to typically put 50% uh, or so, up to 50% or so of the total aeration in the first treatment cell, uh, heavily loaded towards the inlet. And that's because we want to we want to get the bugs going. We want to get the heavy lifting done as quickly as possible uh, when the water first enters the system. Um, so with that, some but not all of the solids are kept in suspension. And you'll typically see three or more cells in series. So that means that the water flows into cell one, out of cell one, into cell two, out of two, et cetera. Um, the last cell is very, is very typically, very typically going to be quiescent or a settling pond. So no aeration, just settling, quiet, let the water just kind of chill. Uh, get about 95% of the BOD out and TSS, we're going to drop down below 60 milligrams per liter with the caveat about uh, algae. And here's a, uh, here's a photo that a coworker of mine took, and I really appreciate her sharing with this, sharing with, sharing this photo with me because it tells the story so well. So on the left side uh, of the lagoon, we've got facultative. Uh, you can see that the bubble patterns do not overlap. There's plenty of space between them, and there's plenty of uh, space around them also. Got about a half a dozen aerators in that cell, and they're nicely spaced out with plenty of kind of still water also. Uh, while I'm on this slide, I want to talk about something real quick, though. That hard line that runs between the green side and the blue side, 
uh, that's a baffle. And baffles are a great, great tool. Uh, if you have a lagoon and you want to change up your treatment strategy, maybe you want to, maybe you've had a growth in population and you're no longer able to uh, meet your affluent limits with the current structure you have. Uh, by adding a baffle, you can create uh, multiple cells in the lagoon. That's without doing the large earthworks project that's going to involve, you know, just big, big piles of capital and years of design and engineering, which are great to do when you wind up with a, a system that'll be, that'll be, uh, you know, really, really suit your needs for years and years to come. But there's always the option. I shouldn't say always. There's sometimes the option to take a uh, little bit less intrusive and a lot less expensive approach. And a baffle is a great way to do that. I just wanted to point that out while we were on this picture. And now we'll talk uh, vigorous mix. So vigorous mix uh, gives you the same treatment capacity. I'm sorry, I apologize for that. A greater treatment capacity than partial mix on the same footprint. Uh, so with the similar airflow, um, we're basing that on uh, we're doing the calculations based on every thousand cubic feet of water. Uh, we're going to put a little bit more DO in the pond than is necessary. Uh, that's that's just simply part of mixing. Um, greater aerator density, and I would say think about vigorous mix as being a half step between partial mix that we just looked at and complete mix that we'll look at after this. And vigorous mix most typically found, not surprisingly, near the inlet to the first treatment cell. A uh, nice photo of a vigorous mix lagoon with the vigorous mix section highlighted for you there. And you can see a whole lot less space between those uh, aerator bubble patterns on the surface in the vigorous mix area. So that takes us next to complete mix. Complete mix, uh, it's a design that includes extensive mixing. So we're going to keep the water column in motion at all times so that that, that you know, that little three-legged stool, bugs, nutrients, and DL. We've got them all in the same place at the same time, so good digestion is taking place. And you've got to have enough mixing to keep the solids in suspension. Uh, configuration, circular or square. Um, you know, that, that's an interesting one. The EPA actually calls a rectangular lagoon square uh, in their discussion of complete mix. But um, you'll typically see at least three cells in series, and it is important with complete mix to note that the ratio of length to width is important to avoid creating dead zones in the design. Uh, so complete mix design does require a little bit more attention to how you lay it out in the land that's available. And for the same flow and loading, a complete mix, complete mix system will consume uh, less land than partial mix, but it will consume about 10x the energy for the same for the same size system, same flows and loadings. Uh, algae and duckweed, they won't grow in, in moving water and you won't see uh, the ice in the cold of winter. So uh, this photo is possibly my favorite lagoon photo that we have. And I just, I, that just, it just makes me wanna take one of those folding bag chairs and just, uh, you know, sit there and read a book for a while or something. Uh, looking at the air, Aeration pattern, though, you can see complete, completely interlocked uh, areas of influence from the aerators. Um, there is no still water in, in the big area of that treatment field. Uh, there is some still water around the edge. I mean, the reality is that uh, you can't put an aerator every single place because lagoons have slope sides. And if you put an aerator on a, yeah, we, we won't go too far into why we don't put aerators on slope sides, but we'll just leave it at aerators are on the, on the level bottom of the pond. Uh, so that takes us to a version of complete mix, uh, maybe a little bit, we could call it an upgrade even, and uh, complete mix with return activated sludge. Uh, so with this system, we're actually borrowing a page from the, uh, from the mechanical plant playbook, because in mechanical plants, they take the sludge, remember it's that, that bio, biomass, it's really rich, in nutrients and microbes, and they pump it back to uh, they pump it back to near the front of the process, the treatment process. They put it back in the water. Um, by doing that, they create another term for us, which is MLSS or mixed liquor suspended solids, 
measured in milligrams per liter or parts per million. And that's just a that's just a quantification of how much sludge is in the water. Uh, you get fantastic, fantastic digestion. Uh, returning sludge um, increases microbial density and increased microbial density plus increased DO. As you might guess, we keep talking the three things, air, air, food, bug, more air, more bugs. You can chew your way through a lot more, a lot more nutrients, a lot more food. And that's why this, can, this design features the shortest hydraulic retention time. And a photo of a complete mix with RAS. So that that sure is a lot of bubbles breaking the uh, breaking the surface there, and that takes us to our next topic, which is bubbles. So oxygen requirements are expressed in terms of pounds per pound of what you're trying to remove. Uh, the chart we've got right here shows BOD5 and ammonia, and if we take a look, we can see that we need to put one and a half to two pounds of oxygen into the into the water for every pound of BOD that we want to remove. Looking at ammonia, that number becomes 4.6. And you heard me say earlier that there are different bugs at work. Uh, the autotrophic bacteria are smaller, slower, weaker. They're growing on those media carriers that I showed you. Uh, they're great at nitrification of ammonia. Uh, but what they're not great at is competing. Um, so we've got to create a, a lot of DO in the water for them to grow and thrive and survive and do the work we need them to do. Heterotrophs are bigger, they're faster, stronger, hungrier. Uh, they do exist in the nitrox also, but they're the heavy lifters out in the lagoon ponds. They're the ones that are really chewing their way through the BOD. And um, I, I want to point out as well that providing excess air results in extra expense. And part of the reason for that is that when you put a pound of air in the water, you're not necessarily getting a pound of air, of oxygen. In reality, you're getting about a fifth of a pound of oxygen. And that's because atmospheric air is you know, right around 21% oxygen, the rest being other gases. Uh, so just please understand that as we're talking about adding O2 to water, we're talking about that as a portion of the air that's being that's being blown in in the bubbles. Uh, so bubble size relates to efficiency. Um, looking at efficiency, that acronym SOTE is uh, standard oxygen transfer efficiency. It's measured in clean water. And I'd like to point out that Triple Point is a very firm believer in third party independent verification of claims on things like oxygen transfer efficiency. Always happy to look at and show folks uh, the, the empirical research and the third party certification on our stuff. But I would encourage anyone who's looking at uh, aeration to ask the question about uh, claimed uh, SOTI numbers. Is, has this been independently verified? And you know, dig a little deeper, um, ask the hard questions, and you know, make sure that you really are getting what you think you're getting. So with that, um, fine bubbles over on the left, uh, they're going to be tiny, up to a three millimeter diameter. And you can see the transfer, the sodium numbers there. Uh, they're per foot because that's as the bubble rises through the water column. Medium bubble, a little bit bigger, coarse bubble, uh, larger still. And if we think about air in terms of cubic feet of air, uh, one cubic foot of air would form a, a bubble with 4.8. 4.8 square feet of surface area. Break that up a little bit, get to 185 square feet, uh, break it up into 512 bubbles, get up to about 1,800 square feet. Uh, it's that surface of the bubble that the exchange takes place on. So you've got to have surface area, and it's got to be clean surface area and not you know, covered up in contaminants from the lagoon. Uh, but that is, that is how we transfer air into the water. Uh, the efficiency of that transfer process can be depicted as such. And up at the top, we have our Aries aerator. And this is expressed in pounds of oxygen per horsepower per hour. 
So a one horsepower motor running for an hour will put seven cubic feet of air into, uh, excuse me, seven pounds of air into the water uh, using Aries. Uh, go to a course bubble or surface aerator and that drops down significantly. Our next topic is discharge permits. And uh, discharge permits are all recorded in NPDES, the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System is the repository and the Clean Water Act prohibits anyone from discharging pollutants through a point source into a water of the United States. That's lakes, rivers, streams, et cetera, unless you have an NPDES permit. Uh, so you can go out on their website, it's public. You can look at your local wastewater treatment facilities permit. Uh, you, can find, you can also find information about uh, variances on there and excursions and violations, all sorts of information. Um, permits are issued by the state EPA though. And uh, they permit, they inspect, and they enforce. Uh, enforcement can be in the, in the way of a fine. It can be in the way of directed action. Um, can wind up in court. Uh, that's, that's state level though. Uh, state renews them every five years, and there's some uh, typical parameters to see on a municipal permit. And here's a municipal permit example. Uh, this is actually from Iowa, and you can see uh, CBOD, suspended solids, dissolved oxygen, and pH. And uh, I, I do want to point out that in the United States, Iowa and Missouri are really leading the charge in reducing ammonia, uh, ammonia in affluent water from wastewater treatment plants. Um, Iowa permits show up with a second page and it's you know a full sheet of month by month what your discharge permits are as far as your ammonia levels, uh, not just in, in terms of uh, how much in milligrams per liter, but also in total weight in pounds per day. So you'll see that on, a, on an Iowa or Missouri discharge permit. Some other things that'll show up on permits that, that aren't depicted here. Uh, you'll also see um, phosphorus on there sometimes, and uh, you may see nitrate. So let's jump into the next topic, which is algae and duckweed. And algae is uh, either a multicellular or single cellular. It's either moving around on its own or it's going with the flow. Uh, divided into three major groups by color. Uh, green, brown, and red. Um, interesting thing about brown is that they're blamed for uh, toxic red algae blooms. There's some uh, symbiotic relationship there. Uh, red algae is primarily filamentous, and that means it's real stringy. And uh, think of it as, as you know, kind of stuff that clogs up and and mungs up everything that it it gets in touch with. And that's pretty accurate as far as describing a filamentous. Um, it is a necessary component of a facultative lagoon. And as we were talking about that uh, air water barrier on the surface, um, actually you're getting O2 released throughout the water column uh, by the algae. Uh, and that's a result of photosynthesis. And algae is present in all lagoons. Here's a couple of pictures of what the stuff looks like. And duckweed or lemna minor is our next one. And it's a small leafy aquatic plant. I, I, I find this stuff fascinating. Personally, I find it fascinating. The idea that it's found worldwide. Uh, some places it's even used, it's even used as food. Hopefully they're not taking any of it off of wastewater lagoons, because uh, whatever contaminants and pollutants are in the lagoon are gonna be present in the in the flesh of the plant. Uh, it's spread through the movement of animals, typically waterfall. So if you think about a duck or a goose or something like that, uh, hanging out in one pond and you know has a little bit of duckweed on him, he flies to another one that doesn't have any duckweed on it, guess what? Now that one's infected. I shouldn't, I shouldn't say infected. Now that one has duckweed also. Uh, so it's uh, gonna grow in slower, still moving water containing nutrients like ammonia and phosphorus. Not surprising then that it grows well in a lagoon. What I do find really surprising is the idea that there's more soybean, excuse me, there's more protein in duckweed than soybeans. That's amazing to me. Also, it's the fastest growing plant on earth. And that theoretical docker goose that landed with a single piece of duckweed on him, if he landed on an acre pond, 45 days later, it would be covered. 
uh, seasonal die-off creates problem. Uh, problems, um, several problems. Number one, all of those nutrients that had been uh, pulled out of the water in order to fuel the growth of the plant, yeah, they're going to wind up back in the water. They get released as it bio, as it degrades, as it uh, as it biodegrades. Uh, the other thing is that you're going to increase your your sludge layer because that plant matter is all going to drop down and and lay on top of it and get integrated into it. It's going to cause sludge sludge to bulk up as a result. Uh, some photos, and there's the uh, sushi for those who are interested in trying to find duckweed as uh, edible. I do want to point out on the left, this is a technology that a, another uh, manufacturer in the industry brought to market years ago, and it's largely died out at this point. Uh, so you would establish a grid system on your lagoon. Your operators would go out and they'd clean out grid squares and of all the duckweed, and they'd grow back and they'd clean it out. And, now, that was just sort of how you would do it. The problem is that the stuff grows so fast and so aggressively that systems, municipalities found themselves adding manpower just to manage duckweed. So uh, you can keep algae and duckweed down through aeration. Uh, you can see in that photo there, uh, that circular area is open because of the aeration mixing, moving water. Duckweed doesn't like it, doesn't grow there. Uh, so our next topic is going to be weather, and I am personally very happy that we're done with this sort of this sort of landscape for a little while. Um, but it is important to understand that this is a, a multi-cell lagoon system uh, that's iced over uh, in the non-aerated cells, and it is important to understand what winter uh, does to a lagoon. So looking at um, that 10 degree C reduction temperature. I've said this a couple of times today, and that's because it's an important concept, and I really wanted to be sure that I brought it home. Um, also, ice can form when there's no aeration. Uh, the picture on the right there is a surface aerator. We'll talk about those in a second, uh, but that one's all iced up. Um, the popping sludge when temperatures invert on the shoulder season, as you move into and out of winter, that's when a faculty of lagoons more likely to see uh, popping sludge or a uh, you know rising sludge with the inversion. Uh, the algae is going to die off about 5C, and then you'll see a spike in your total suspend uh, TSS total suspended solids. And that stratification that I talked about, formation of a thermocline between different temperature waters, that's going to occur around 4C, and also duckweed dies off at about the same time, uh, releasing nutrients. Uh, surface aerator issues. Um, surface aerator. It, the way that these work is that they take water out of the pond and they throw it up in the air, basically. Uh, as the water is in contact with the air, it's going to pull oxygen in, um, and that's how a surface aerator works. The downside, uh, one of the downsides to surface aerators in the winter, as they're liberating all of that water from the pond, uh, they're creating mist. That mist is going to freeze very rapidly, and a, a nice amount of it's going to freeze on the surface aerator. Uh, you wind up with a high center of gravity. Uh, the wind blows or, uh, you know, just something random happens, creates a little ripple on the pond, and real quick, they turn over. They flip, they turn turtle, they drown. Um, you've got electricity and water, it shorts out, uh, motors shot, and the, real the sad reality is that uh, ponds with surface aerators that flip over, they just, they don't get addressed until it's warm enough to get out and work on them. So along those same lines with temperature, um, this is some uh, case study data from a lagoon in Iowa. And I'm putting this up because I want to talk about the fact that uh, autotrophic bacteria do exist in wastewater lagoons. You don't have to have a, nitrify, a, a, a nitrox or an ammonia removal system uh, to get the ammonia out of the water in the summer. In the winter, it's not going anywhere. And that's because their uh, activity, the autotrophic bacteria, autotrophic bacteria's activity is slowed so, so far down that they're barely eating anything. And that's why when you look at the blue line, you can see an, a lagoon system removes ammonia nicely during the summer months, and then uh, you really, really spike in the cold weather months. So our uh, next topic is energy efficient lagoons topic near and dear to my heart, and I want to start with a quick quiz. Uh, so just to yourself, uh, which do you think requires less energy? Blowing air into water or throwing water into air? 
and here's some pictures of blowing air into water and what it looks like uh, for surface aerators throwing water into air. And if you said that blowing air into water is going to require less energy, you're exactly right. Uh, fine bubble diffuser, you can see the membrane surface uh, with all those little tiny thousands and thousands of fine bubbles forming on it. And then, you know, working their way up to the surface and imparting oxygen the whole way. So since we know that uh, since we know that air is going to be putting air in water is going to be an expensive thing to do, and what we're going to do less expensive than surface aerators, we should talk about energy consumption. Um, this is based on mechanical plants. Uh, source is Ameren, Illinois. They're the local utility in Illinois, uh, but they've concluded that about 54% of your energy consumption is going to be uh, attributable to aeration. And if we bring this chart back up and look at it again, that area between the Aries line up at about seven pounds of oxygen per horsepower hour, uh, the area below the Aries line, but above the other two lines, that's potential savings. All of that inefficiency is potential for savings. And if we look at it a little bit differently in terms of pounds of uh, oxygen per horsepower hour, again, uh, there's the ranges and I'm showing you a source here, uh, which is the state of art state of the art oxygen transfer from GSEE Environmental. There are numbers on this. Uh, down at the bottom left, I want to point out the uh, surface aerators. This is something that we see whenever we go out to a system that has surface aerators. Invariably, there's a, a graveyard, a boneyard. There's some number of them that have died from any number of causes and have just been set aside. Uh, I've, I've yet to be out and see surface aerators where 100% of them are on the pond and operating. Uh, another way to add some uh, efficiency is to add VFDs. Uh, variable frequency drive enables a compatible motor to run at other than full speed. Uh, it's important to note that some utilities are offering rebates on VFDs. Ameren, Illinois, again, picking on them, they, uh, they are of the opinion that the energy savings run between 15 and 50%. Uh, if you're if you're applying a VFD to your system, uh, what happens is your operators go out, they test the dissolved oxygen levels in the pond, and then they adjust the aerators and they adjust the speed of the blower in order to hit their target without going way way over. Because again, we've talked about this already. Excessive use of oxygen just leads to excessive expense. I created a uh, little checklist here. Um, for ways to reduce the total cost of operation. We've talked quite a bit about uh, oxygen transfer already, moving maintenance on shore. I do wanna talk that a little bit more. Um, and uh, this will pertain to the blower maintenance, the membranes, all of it. Uh, so a system that is optimized and started up and commissioned and put in service uh, won't stay at that same level of performance. It'll degrade over time. Uh, belts get loose. Oil wears out, filters get clogged, et cetera. And when you think about a blower, uh, that is consuming the majority of the money that you're spending for electricity on your lagoon system. And just the simple act of replacing that uh, air filter on a regular basis will keep your lagoon, lagoon system operating more efficiently. All righty, uh, next up, some recommended webinars. And now that training is becoming harder to get, uh, in-person training especially due to the virus, uh, we've launched our online Lagooniversity. And you can see the link at the bottom there at lagooniversity.com. Uh, this is a platform where all of our webinars are recorded and available on demand. Uh, while we cannot offer pre-approved CEUs yet, we are developing quizzes and working on getting these registered in the different states and provinces for CEU credits for operators as well as PDH for engineers. And uh, our website is on the screen now at lagoons.com. Um, I do want to point out uh, that you can join Lagoons Do It Better. Uh, and there is a swag alert associated with the discussion of Lagoons Do It Better. That's a community where you'll find informational blogs, videos, training events like this, and in-person training events. Uh, we also have a Facebook community. 
um, that you can join. You see a lot of operators in the blogs and on the Facebook community uh, passing information back and forth, talking and you know helping one another. And it's it's something that we're very happy to to support. Uh, if you go on LDIB, you're going to um, fill out a little form and uh, once we can get back in the office, we're going to get a nice hat out to you also. So that brings us to the end of the presentation and question and answer. And let's see here. And I see uh, one question. Has this been recorded? Yes, it has. Um, next question, is there a recommended DO set point? Uh, yes, DO set point is going to vary depending on uh, the type of lagoon, the type of aerators, and what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, so DO set point will be quite a bit higher if your goal is, you know, in the in the nitrox um, to uh, to affect rem removal of ammonia. Uh, lower in a uh, lower in a partial mixed lagoon, of course, and then you kind of float on DO with uh, facultative lagoon, and what you uh, what you get, what you see is what you get, and uh, you know, it's all based on the wind energy. All right, I am uh, checking for other questions. Boy, it would be great if that was a bigger window. Uh, I am not seeing any other questions here. Uh, so this will be available online. My information is on the screen. Uh, questions, comments, concerns. If you think I got something horribly wrong, you want to yell at me. Call me up, let's talk about it. Uh, if you have a system that you need help with, we'd love to help you with it. And if you're operating a Lagoon system and you're not already a member of Lagoons Do It Better, we'd love to welcome you to the fold. Thank you all for attending today.